Chapter 7, Part E of The Wealth of Nations, Book 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Book 4, Chapter 7, Part E of Colonies. The monopoly of the colony trade, besides, by forcing towards it a much greater proportion of the capital of Great Britain than what would naturally have gone to it, seems to have broken altogether that natural balance which would otherwise have taken place among all the different branches of British industry. The industry of Great Britain, instead of being accommodated to a great number of small markets, has been principally suited to one great market. Her commerce, instead of running in a great number of small channels, has been taught to run principally in one great channel. But the whole system of her industry and commerce has thereby been rendered less secure, the whole state of her body politic less healthful than it otherwise would have been. In her present condition, Great Britain resembles one of those unwholesome bodies in which some of the vital parts are overgrown, and which, upon that account, are liable to many dangerous disorders, scarce incident to those in which all the parts are more properly proportioned a small stop in that great blood vessel which has been artificially swelled beyond its natural dimensions and through which an unnatural proportion of the industry and commerce of the country has been forced to circulate is very likely to bring on the most dangerous disorders upon the whole body politic the expectation of a rupture with the colonies accordingly has struck the people of great britain with more terror than they ever felt for a spanish armada or a french invasion it was this terror whether well or ill-grounded which rendered the repeal of the stamp act among the merchants at least a popular measure in the total exclusion from the colony market was it to last only for a few years the greater part of our merchants used to fancy that they foresaw an entire stop to their trade the greater part of our master manufactures, the entire ruin of their business, and the greater part of our workmen, an end of their employment. A rupture with any of our neighbors upon the continent, though likely, too, to occasion some stop or interruption in the employments of some or all these different orders of people, is foreseen, however, without any general emotion. The blood, of which the circulation is stopped in some of the smaller vessels, easily disgorges itself into the greater without occasioning any dangerous disorder. But when it is stopped in any of the greater vessels, conversions, apoplexy, or death are the immediate and unavoidable consequences. If but one of those overgrown manufacturers, which, by means either of bounties or of the monopoly of the home and colony markets, have been artificially raised up to any unnatural height, finds some small stop or interruption in its employment it frequently occasions a mutiny and disorder alarming to government and embarrassing even to the deliberations of the legislature how great therefore would be the disorder and confusion it was thought which must necessarily be occasioned by a sudden and entire stop in the employment of so great a proportion of our principal manufacturers some moderate and gradual relaxation of the laws which give to great britain the exclusive trade to the colonies till it is rendered in a great measure free seems to be the only expedient which can in all future times deliver her from this danger which can enable her or even force her to withdraw some part of her capital from this overgrown employment and to turn it though with less profit towards other employments and which by gradually diminishing one branch of her industry and gradually increasing all the rest can by degrees restore all the different branches of it to that natural healthful and proper proportion which perfect liberty necessarily establishes and which perfect liberty can alone preserve to open the colony trade all at once to all nations might not only occasion some transitory inconvenience but a great permanent loss to the greater part of those whose industry or capital is at present engaged in it the sudden loss of the employment even of the ships which import the eighty two thousand hogsheads of tobacco which are over and above the consumption of great britain might alone be felt very sensibly such are the unfortunate effects of all the regulations of the mercantile system they not only introduce very dangerous disorders into the state of the body politic but disorders which it is often difficult to remedy without occasioning for a time at least still greater disorders in what manner therefore the colony trade ought gradually to be opened what are the restraints which ought first and what are those which ought last to be taken away 
or in what manner the natural system of perfect liberty and justice ought gradually to be restored, we must leave to the wisdom of future statesmen and legislators to determine. Five different events, unforeseen and unthought of, have very fortunately concurred to hinder Great Britain from feeling, so sensibly as it was generally expected she would, the total exclusion which has now taken place for more than a year, from the 1st of December, 1774, from a very important branch of the colony trade, that of the twelve associated provinces of North America. First, those colonies, in preparing themselves for their non-importation agreement, drained Great Britain completely of all the commodities which were fit for their market. Secondly, the extraordinary demand of the Spanish flota has, this year, drained Germany and the north of many commodities, linen in particular, which used to come into competition even in the British market with the manufactures of Great Britain. Thirdly, the peace between Russia and Turkey has occasioned an extraordinary demand from the Turkey market, which, during the distress of the country, and while a Russian fleet was cruising in the archipelago, had been very poorly supplied. Fourthly, the demand of the north of Europe for the manufactures of Great Britain has been increasing from year to year for some time past. And, fifthly, the late partition and consequential pacification of Poland, by opening the market of that great country, have, this year, added an extraordinary demand from thence to the increasing demand of the north. These events are all, except the fourth, in their nature transitory and accidental. And the inclusion from so important a branch of the colony trade, if unfortunately it should continue much longer, may still occasion some degree of distress. This distress, however, as it will come on gradually, will be felt much less severely than if it had come on all at once. And, in the meantime, the industry and capital of the country may find a new employment and direction, so as to prevent this distress from ever rising to any considerable height. The monopoly of the colony trade, therefore, so far as it has turned towards that trade a greater proportion of the capital of Great Britain than what would otherwise have gone to it, has in all cases turned it from a foreign trade of consumption with a neighboring into one with a more distant country, in many cases from a direct foreign trade of consumption into a roundabout one, and, in some cases, from all foreign trade of consumption into a carrying trade. It has, in all cases, therefore, turned it from a direction in which it would have maintained a greater quantity of productive labor, into one in which it can maintain a much smaller quantity. By suiting, besides, to one particular market only, so great a part of the industry and commerce of Great Britain, it has rendered the whole state of that industry and commerce more precarious and less secure than if their produce had been accommodated to a greater variety of markets. We must carefully distinguish between the effects of the colony trade and those of the monopoly of that trade. The former are always and necessarily beneficial, the latter always and necessarily hurtful. But the former are so beneficial that the colony trade, though subject to a monopoly, and notwithstanding the hurtful effects of that monopoly, is still, upon the whole, beneficial and greatly beneficial, though a good deal less so than it otherwise would be. The effect of the colony trade in its natural and free state is to open a great, though distant, market for such parts of the produce of British industry as may exceed the demand of the markets nearer home, of those of Europe, and of the countries which lie round the Mediterranean Sea. In its natural and free state, the colony trade, without drawing from those markets any part of the produce which had ever been sent to them, encourages Great Britain to increase the surplus continually, by continually presenting new equivalents to be exchanged for it. In its natural and free state, the colony trade tends to increase the quantity of productive labor in Great Britain, but without altering in any respect the direction of that which had been employed there before. In the natural and free state of the colony trade, the competition of all other nations would hinder the rate of profit from rising above the common level, either in the new market or in the new employment. The new market, without drawing anything from the old one, would create, if one may say so, a new produce for its own supply and that new produce would constitute a new capital for carrying on the new employment, which, in the same manner, would draw nothing from the old one. 
the monopoly of the colony trade on the contrary by excluding the competition of other nations and thereby raising the rate of profit both in the new market and in the new employment draws produce from the old market and capital from the old employment to augment our share of the colony trade beyond what it otherwise would be is the avowed purpose of the monopoly if our share of that trade were to be no greater with than it would have been without the monopoly there could have been no reason for establishing the monopoly but whatever forces into a branch of trade of which the returns are slower and more distant than those of the greater part of other trades a greater proportion of the capital of any country than what of its own accord would go to that branch necessarily renders the whole quantity of productive labor annually maintained there the whole annual produce of the land and labor of that country less than they otherwise would be it keeps down the revenue of the inhabitants of that country below what it would naturally rise to and thereby diminishes their power of accumulation it not only hinders at all times their capital from maintaining so great a quantity of productive labor as it would otherwise maintain but it hinders it from increasing so fast as it would otherwise increase and consequently from maintaining a still greater quantity of productive labor the natural good effects of the colony trade however more than counterbalance to great britain the bad effects of the monopoly so that monopoly and altogether that trade even as it is carried on at present is not only advantageous but greatly advantageous the new market and the new employment which are opened by the colony trade are of much greater extent than that portion of the old market and of the old employment which is lost by the monopoly the new produce and the new capital which has been created if one may say so by the colony trade maintain in great britain a greater quantity of productive labor than what can have been thrown out of employment by the revulsion of capital from other trades of which the returns are more frequent if the colony trade however even as it is carried on at present is advantageous to great britain it is not by means of the monopoly but in spite of the monopoly it is rather for the manufactured than for the rude produce of europe that the colony trade opens a new market agriculture is the proper business of all new colonies a business which the cheapness of land renders more advantageous than any other they abound therefore in the rude produce of land and instead of importing it from other countries they have generally a large surplus to export in new colonies agriculture either draws hands from all other employments or keeps them from going to any other employment there are few hands to spare for the necessary and none for the ornamental manufactures the greater part of the manufactures of both kinds they find it cheaper to purchase of other countries than to make for themselves it is chiefly by encouraging the manufactures of europe that the colony trade indirectly encourages its agriculture the manufactures of europe to whom that trade gives employment constitute a new market for the produce of the land and the most advantageous of all markets the home market for the corn and cattle for the bread and butcher's meat of europe is thus greatly extended by means of the trade to america but that the monopoly of the trade of populous and thriving colonies is not alone sufficient to establish or even to maintain manufactures in any country the examples of spain and portugal sufficiently demonstrate spain and portugal were manufacturing countries before they had any considerable colonies since they had the richest and most fertile in the world they have both ceased to be so in spain and portugal the bad effects of the monopoly aggravated by other causes have perhaps nearly overbalanced the natural good effects of the colony trade these causes seem to be other monopolies of different kinds the degradation of the value of gold and silver below what it is in most other countries the exclusion from foreign markets by improper taxes upon exportation and the narrowing of the home market by still more improper taxes upon the transportation of goods from one part of the country to another but above all that irregular and partial administration of justice which often protects the rich and powerful debtor from the pursuit of his injured creditor and which makes the industrious part of the nation afraid to prepare goods for the consumption of those haughty and great men to whom they dare not refuse to sell upon credit and from whom they are altogether uncertain of repayment in england on the contrary the natural good effects of the colony trade assisted by other causes have in a great measure conquered the bad effects of the monopoly these causes seem to be 
the general liberty of trade, which, notwithstanding some restraints, is at least equal, perhaps superior, to what it is in any other country. The liberty of exporting, duty-free, almost all sorts of goods which are the produce of domestic industry, to almost any foreign country. And what, perhaps, is of still greater importance, the unbounded liberty of transporting them from one part of our own country to any other without being obliged to give any account to any public office without being liable to question or examination of any kind but above all that equal and impartial administration of justice which renders the rights of the meanest british subject respectable to the greatest and which by securing to every man the fruits of his own industry gives the greatest and most effectual encouragement to every sort of industry if the manufactures of great britain however have been advanced as they certainly have by the colony trade it has not been by means of the monopoly of that trade but in spite of the monopoly the effect of the monopoly has been not to augment the quantity but to alter the quality and shape of a part of the manufactures of great britain and to accommodate to a market from which the returns are slow and distant what would otherwise have been accommodated to one from which the returns are frequent and near its effect has consequently been to turn a part of the capital of great britain from an employment in which it would have maintained a greater quantity of manufacturing industry to one in which it maintains a much smaller and thereby to diminish instead of increasing the whole quantity of manufacturing industry maintained in great britain the monopoly of the colony trade therefore like all the other mean and malignant expedients of the mercantile system depresses the industry of all other countries but chiefly that of the colonies without in the least increasing but on the contrary diminishing that of the country in whose favour it is established the monopoly hinders the capital of that country whatever may at any particular time be the extent of that capital from maintaining so great a quantity of productive labour as it would otherwise maintain and from affording so great a revenue to the industrious inhabitants as it would otherwise afford but as capital can be increased only by savings from revenue the monopoly by hindering it from affording so great a revenue as it would otherwise afford necessarily hinders it from increasing so fast as it would otherwise increase and consequently from maintaining a still greater quantity of productive labour and affording a still greater revenue to the industrious inhabitants of that country one great original source of revenue therefore the wages of labour the monopoly must necessarily have rendered at all times less abundant than it otherwise would have been by raising the rate of mercantile profit the monopoly discourages the improvement of land the profit of improvement depends upon the difference between what the land actually produces and what by the application of a certain capital it can be made to produce if this difference affords a greater profit than what can be drawn from an equal capital in any mercantile employment the improvement of land will draw capital from all mercantile employments if the profit is less mercantile employments will draw capital from the improvement of land whatever therefore raises the rate of mercantile profit either lessens the superiority or increases the inferiority of the profit of improvement and in the one case hinders capital from going to improvement and in the other draws capital from it but by discouraging improvement the monopoly necessarily retards the natural increase of another great original source of revenue the rent of land by raising the rate of profit too the monopoly necessarily keeps up the market rate of interest higher than it otherwise would be but the price of land in proportion to the rent which it affords the number of years purchase which is commonly paid for it necessarily falls as the rate of interest rises and rises as the rate of interest falls the monopoly therefore hurts the interest of the landlord two different ways by retarding the natural increase first of his rent and secondly of the price which he would get for his land in proportion to the rent which it affords the monopoly indeed raises the rate of mercantile profit and thereby augments somewhat the gain of our merchants but as it obstructs the natural increase of capital it tends rather to diminish than to increase the sum total of the revenue which the inhabitants of the country derive from the profits of stock a small profit upon a great capital generally affording a greater revenue than a great profit upon a small one 
the monopoly raises the rate of profit but it hinders the sum of profit from rising so high as it otherwise would do all the original sources of revenue the wages of labor the rent of land and the profits of stock the monopoly renders much less abundant than they otherwise would be to promote the little interest of one little order of men in one country it hurts the interest of all other orders of men in that country and of all the men in all other countries it is solely by raising the ordinary rate of profit that the monopoly either has proved or could prove advantageous to any one particular order of men but besides all the bad effects to the country in general which have already been mentioned as necessarily resulting from a higher rate of profit there is one more fatal perhaps than all these put together but which if we may judge from experience is inseparably connected with it the high rate of profit seems everywhere to destroy that parsimony which in other circumstances is natural to the character of the merchant when profits are high that sober virtue seems to be superfluous and expensive luxury to suit better the affluence of his situation but the owners of the great mercantile capitals are necessarily the leaders and conductors of the whole industry of every nation and their example has a much greater influence upon the manners of the whole industrious part of it than that of any other order of men if his employer is attentive and parsimonious the workman is very likely to be so too but if the master is dissolute and disorderly the servant who shapes his work according to the pattern which his master prescribes to him will shape his life too according to the example which he sets him accumulation is thus prevented in the hands of all those who are naturally the most disposed to accumulate and the funds destined for the maintenance of productive labor receive no augmentation from the revenue of those who ought naturally to augment them most the capital of the country instead of increasing gradually dwindles away and the quantity of productive labor maintained in it grows every day less and less have the exorbitant profits of the merchants of cadiz and lisbon augmented the capital of spain and portugal have they alleviated the poverty have they promoted the industry of those two beggarly countries such has been the tone of mercantile expense in those two trading cities that those exorbitant profits far from augmenting the general capital of the country seem scarce to have been sufficient to keep up the capitals upon which they were made foreign capitals are every day intruding themselves if i may say so more and more into the trade of cadiz and lisbon it is to expel those foreign capitals from a trade which their own grows every day more and more insufficient for carrying on that the spaniards and portuguese endeavor every day to straighten more and more the galling bands of their absurd monopoly compare the mercantile manners of cadiz and lisbon with those of amsterdam and you will be sensible how differently the conduct and character of merchants are affected by the high and by the low profits of stock the merchants of london indeed have not yet generally become such magnificent lords as those of cadiz and lisbon but neither are they in general such attentive and parsimonious burghers as those of amsterdam they are supposed however many of them to be a good deal richer than the greater part of the former and not quite so rich as many of the latter but the rate of their profit is commonly much lower than that of the former and a good deal higher than that of the latter light come light go says the proverb and the ordinary tone of expense seems everywhere to be regulated not so much according to the real ability of spending as to the supposed facility of getting money to spend it is thus that the single advantage which the monopoly procures to a single order of men is in many different ways hurtful to the general interest of the country to found a great empire for the sole purpose of raising up a people of customers may at first sight appear a project fit only for a nation of shopkeepers it is however a project altogether unfit for a nation of shopkeepers but extremely fit for a nation whose government is influenced by shopkeepers such statesmen and such statesmen only are capable of fancying that they will find some advantage in employing the blood and treasure of their fellow-citizens to found and maintain such an empire say to a shopkeeper buy me a good estate and i shall always buy my clothes at your shop even though i should pay somewhat dearer than what i can have them for at other shops and you will not find him very forward to embrace your proposal but should any other person buy you such an estate the shopkeeper will be much obliged to your benefactor if he would enjoin you to buy all your clothes at his shop england purchased for some of her subjects who found themselves uneasy at home 
a great estate in a distant country. The price, indeed, was very small, and instead of thirty years' purchase, the ordinary price of land in the present times, it amounted to little more than the expense of the different equipments which made the first discovery, reconnoitred the coast, and took a fictitious possession of the country. The land was good, and of great extent, and the cultivators, having plenty of good ground to work upon, and being for some time at liberty to sell their produce where they pleased, became, in the course of little more than thirty or forty years, between 1620 and 1660, so numerous and thriving a people, that the shopkeepers and other traders of England wished to secure to themselves the monopoly of their custom. Without pretending, therefore, that they had paid any part, either of the original purchase money, or of the subsequent expense of improvement, they petitioned the Parliament that the cultivators of America might for the future be confined to their shop, first, for buying all the goods which they wanted from Europe, and, secondly, for selling all such parts of their own produce as those traders might find it convenient to buy. For they did not find it convenient to buy every part of it. Some parts of it imported into England might have interfered with some of the trades which they themselves carried on at home. Those particular parts of it, therefore, they were willing that the colonists should sell where they could, the farther off the better, and upon that account proposed that their market should be confined to the countries south of Cape Finisterre. A clause in the famous act of navigation established this truly shopkeeper proposal into a law. The maintenance of this monopoly has hitherto been the principal, or more properly, perhaps, the sole end and purpose of the dominion which Great Britain assumes over her colonies. In the exclusive trade, it is supposed, consists the great advantage of provinces, which have never yet afforded either revenue or military force for the support of the civil government or the defense of the mother country. The monopoly is the principal badge of their dependency, and it is the sole fruit which has hitherto been gathered from that dependency. Whatever expense Great Britain has hitherto laid out in maintaining this dependency has really been laid out in order to support this monopoly. The expense of the ordinary peace establishment of the colonies amounted, before the commencement of the present disturbances, to the pay of twenty regiments of foot, to the expense of the artillery, stores, and extraordinary provisions with which it was necessary to supply them, and to the expense of a very considerable naval force, which was constantly kept up, in order to guard from the smuggling vessels of other nations the immense coast of North America and that of our West Indian islands. The whole expense of this peace establishment was a charge upon the revenue of Great Britain, and was, at the same time, the smallest part of what the dominion of the colonies has cost the mother country. If we would know the amount of the whole, we must add to the annual expense of this peace establishment the interest of the sums which, in consequence of their considering her colonies as provinces subject to her dominion, Great Britain has, upon different occasions, laid out upon their defense. We must add to it, in particular, the whole expense of the late war, and a great part of that of the war which preceded it. The late war was altogether a colony quarrel, and the whole expense of it, in whatever part of the world it might have been laid out, whether in Germany or the East Indies, ought justly to be stated to the account of the colonies. It amounted to more than ninety millions sterling including not only the new debt which was contracted but the two shillings in the pound additional land tax and the sums which were every year borrowed from the sinking fund the spanish war which began in seventeen thirty nine was principally a colony quarrel its principal object was to prevent the search of the colony ships which carried on a contraband trade with the spanish main this whole expense is in reality a bounty which has been given in order to support a monopoly the pretended purpose of it was to encourage the manufactures and to increase the commerce of Great Britain. But its real effect has been to raise the rate of mercantile profit and to enable our merchants to turn into a branch of trade, of which the returns are more slow and distant than those of the greater part of other trades, a greater proportion of their capital than they otherwise would have done, two events which, if a bounty could have prevented, it might perhaps have been very well worth while to give such a bounty. Under the present system of management, therefore, Great Britain derives nothing but loss from the dominion which she assumes over her colonies. To propose that Great Britain should voluntarily give up all authority over her colonies, and leave them to elect their own magistrates, to enact their own laws, and to make peace and war, as they might think proper, 
would be to propose such a measure as never was, and never will be, adopted by any nation in the world. No nation ever voluntarily gave up the dominion of any province, how troublesome soever it might be to govern it, and how small soever the revenue which it afforded might be in proportion to the expense which it occasioned. Such sacrifices, though they might frequently be agreeable to the interest, are always mortifying to the pride of every nation, and, what is perhaps of still greater consequence, they are always contrary to the private interest of the governing part of it, who would thereby be deprived of the disposal of many places of trust and profit, of many opportunities of acquiring wealth and distinction, which the possession of the most turbulent, and, to the great body of the people, the most unprofitable province, seldom fails to afford. The most visionary enthusiast would scarce be capable of proposing such a measure, with any serious hopes at least of its ever being adopted. If it was adopted, however, Great Britain would not only be immediately freed from the whole annual expense of the peace establishment of the colonies, but might settle with them such a treaty of commerce as would effectually secure to her a free trade, more advantageous to the great body of the people, though less so to the merchants, than the monopoly which she at present enjoys. By thus parting good friends, the natural affection of the colonies to the mother country, which, perhaps, our late dissensions have well nigh extinguished, would quickly revive. It might dispose them not only to respect, for whole centuries together, that treaty of commerce which they had concluded with us at parting, but to favor us in war as well as in trade, and instead of turbulent and factious subjects, to become our most faithful, affectionate, and generous allies. And the same sort of parental affection on the one side, and filial respect on the other, might revive between Great Britain and her colonies, which used to subsist between those of ancient Greece and the mother city from which they descended. In order to render any province advantageous to the empire to which it belongs, it ought to afford, in time of peace, a revenue to the public sufficient not only for defraying the whole expense of its own peace establishment, but for contributing its proportion to the support of the general government of the empire. Every province necessarily contributes, more or less, to increase the expense of that general government. If any particular province, therefore, does not contribute its share towards defraying this expense, an unequal burden must be thrown upon some other part of the empire. The extraordinary revenue, too, which every province affords to the public in time of war, ought, from parity of reason, to bear the same proportion to the extraordinary revenue of the whole empire, which its ordinary revenue does in time of peace. That neither the ordinary nor extraordinary revenue which Great Britain derives from her colonies bears this proportion to the whole revenue of the British Empire will readily be allowed. The monopoly, it has been supposed, indeed, by increasing the private revenue of the people of Great Britain, and thereby enabling them to pay greater taxes, compensates the deficiency of the public revenue of the colonies. But this monopoly I have endeavored to show, though a very grievous tax upon the colonies, and though it may increase the revenue of a particular order of men in Great Britain, diminishes, instead of increasing, that of the great body of the people and consequently diminishes, instead of increasing, the ability of the great body of the people to pay taxes. The men, too, whose revenue the monopoly increases, constitute a particular order, which it is both absolutely impossible to tax beyond the proportion of other orders, and extremely impolitic even to attempt to tax beyond that proportion, as I shall endeavor to show in the following book. No particular resource, therefore, can be drawn from this particular order. The colonies may be taxed either by their own assemblies or by the Parliament of Great Britain. That the colony assemblies can never be so managed as to levy upon their constituents a public revenue, sufficient not only to maintain at all times their own civil and military establishment, but to pay their proper proportion of the expense of the general government of the British Empire, seems not very probable. It was a long time before even the Parliament of England, though placed immediately under the eye of the sovereign, could be brought under such a system of management, or could be rendered sufficiently liberal in their grants for supporting the civil and military establishments even of their own country. It was only by distributing among the particular members of Parliament a great part either of the offices, or of the disposal of the offices arising from this civil and military establishment, that such a system of management could be established, even with regard to the Parliament of England. But the distance of the colony assemblies from the eye of the sovereign, their number, 
their dispersed situation, and their various constitutions, would render it very difficult to manage them in the same manner, even though the sovereign had the same means of doing it, and those means are wanting. It would be absolutely impossible to distribute among all the leading members of all the colony assemblies such a share, either of the offices, or of the disposal of the offices, arising from the general government of the British Empire, as to dispose them to give up their popularity at home, and to tax their constituents for the support of that general government, of which almost the whole emoluments were to be divided among people who were strangers to them. The unavoidable ignorance of administration, besides, concerning the relative importance of the different members of those different assemblies, the offences which must frequently be given, the blunders which must constantly be committed, in attempting to manage them in this manner, seems to render such a system of management altogether impracticable with regard to them. The colony assemblies, besides, cannot be supposed the proper judges of what is necessary for the defence and support of the whole empire. The care of that defence and support is not entrusted to them. It is not their business, and they have no regular means of information concerning it. The assembly of a province, like the vestry of a parish, may judge very properly concerning the affairs of its own particular district, but can have no proper means of judging concerning those of the whole empire. It cannot even judge properly concerning the proportion which its own province bears to the whole empire, or concerning the relative degree of its wealth and importance, compared with the other provinces, because those other provinces are not under the inspection and superintendency of the assembly of a particular province. What is necessary for the defense and support of the whole empire, and in what proportion each part ought to contribute, can be judged of only by that assembly which inspects and superintends the affairs of the whole empire. It has been proposed accordingly that the colonies should be taxed by requisition, the Parliament of Great Britain determining the sum which each colony ought to pay, and the provincial assembly assessing and levying it in the way that suited best the circumstances of the province. What concerned the whole empire would in this way be determined by the assembly which inspects and superintends the affairs of the whole empire, and the provincial affairs of each colony might still be regulated by its own assembly. Though the colonies should, in this case, have no representatives in the British Parliament, yet, if we may judge by experience, there is no probability that the parliamentary requisition would be unreasonable. The Parliament of England has not, upon any occasion, shown the smallest disposition to overburden those parts of the empire, which are not represented in Parliament. The islands of Guernsey and Jersey, without any means of resisting the authority of Parliament, are more lightly taxed than any part of Great Britain. Parliament, in attempting to exercise its supposed right, whether well or ill-grounded, of taxing the colonies, has never hitherto demanded of them anything which even approached to a just proportion to what was paid by their fellow subjects at home. If the contribution of the colonies, besides, was to rise or fall in proportion to the rise or fall of the land tax, Parliament could not tax them, without taxing, at the same time, its own constituents, and the colonies might, in this case, be considered as virtually represented in Parliament. End of Book 4, Chapter 7, Part E